So this lecture is going to start a new unit on spatial data and spatial data analysis. Broadly speaking, there are three types of spatial data that we're going to learn how to analyze. Uh, point pattern data, point reference data, and block data. Uh, point pattern data is when what you're interested in is the spatial pattern of the points themselves, not any sort of attribute associated with those points. Uh, point reference data is when what's of interest is actually the attributes at locations, uh, but you, but those locations ha uh, have some x, y, or x, y, z coordinate, um, and this is often known as ge also known as geostatistical data. This is kind of one of the most common forms of spatial data because you have some attribute you're trying to interpolate it or infer it or predict it, or you just have some, you know data that you're interested in modeling and you need to account for the spatial autocorrelation in that data. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's block reference data, which is where you don't have points, but you have areas that have some attribute associated with them. So that could be some grid or raster-based uh, data, uh, such as remote sensing, or it could be some sort of uh, vector or polygon reference data such as from a, a GIS later for you know political units such as countries or states or counties. I'm going to start off this unit focusing on uh, point pattern data. Um, so like I just mentioned in point pattern data we're interested in the locations of points not their attribution attributes uh, and the primary question uh, with point pattern data usually centers around the, the degree of aggregation. So in these three panels at the bottom, what we can see are, are randomly generated examples of uh, data that is truly spatially random. You know, the points were uh, generated without reference to each other. Uh, you know, an over dispersed data set uh, where they're much more regular than you would expect by chance. In this case, uh, you, know, you know, roughly on a, a one, a, a unit one grid with some noise. Uh, and then uh, here on the other side, we have an example of clustered data where there are you know, clusters here with uh, you know, of points aggregated near each other. And so uh, you'd want to be able to detect over dispersion versus clustering, and then uh, possibly also be interested in knowing uh, the spatial scales of this, kind of knowing that this is you know, roughly a one meter uh, it's, if that was meters, that would be you know, roughly a one meter uh, regular uh, over dispersed pattern. And that, you know, that these clusters have some characteristic size of, uh, you know, about two here. Uh, one of the main reasons we also do uh, point pattern spatial statistics is that uh, the reality is that, that random data uh, often looks more aggregated uh, to the human eye than it actually is. You know, most people, uh, mo most people's vision of spatially random data is actually a little bit over dispersed. Uh, and they wouldn't expect points to show up near each other by chance as often they, as they do. So it's a good example of, of the use of statistics because of uh, the fact that the human eye and the human brain are pattern matching machines, which will see pattern where there isn't pattern. So that null model of random is, is actually really important uh, in point, point pattern data to reject things that we want to interpret as, as ha showing pattern that is just chance. Uh, the most common statistic for point pattern analysis is known as Ripley's K. It's a fairly simple statistic. Uh, it, what you do is you uh, bin your data by distance. So you're gonna uh, start with a, a focal point and you're gonna calculate uh, counts of points as a function of distance bin. So you're gonna you know, go and, and move outward from each point and calculate you know, uh, you know, how many points are, are one meter away, how many points are two meters away, how many points are three meters away, how many points are four meters away. Um, and then you're going to combine the points. You're going to do that for every point and combine those together, calculate averages, and normalize that by area. Um, so if that statistic is positive, it indicates that there's more points expected 
than by chance at that distance. And if it's negative, there are less uh, points expected than by chance. And then any sort of interval estimation is traditionally done just by uh, some sort of bootstrapping, you know, where you simulate random, uh, true ra spatially random maps. Um, and, uh, you know, then perform this statistic on those maps. And then you do that, you know, thousands of times and uh, you end up with a, a kind of a null model. And the question is, does the uh, spatial pattern you see differ from that null model? Uh, and the, actually the only trickly part about Ripley's K and its calculation is the requirement of a definition of area, um, which is really s quite simple when you're, uh, you know, these donuts of different distance bins do not intersect uh, with uh, the boundaries of the region that you're studying, but it gets much more complicated uh, when they do, and they can get incredibly complicated uh, when the the regions you're interested in are not, you know, simple uh, simple geometric areas such as rectangles or uh, something like that, where the geometry of just calculating the area itself becomes the hard part. And in the bottom right. Uh, bottom right corner, we kind of see the written out in equation form, this statistic this calculation. So you start by uh, looping over uh, all individuals. Uh, for every individual, you loop over every individual except itself, and you count uh, how many individuals fall in a specific, in that specific uh, diameter class uh, or not. So this K function here is just a simple counting function. Uh, you know, do you fall in this in a, any particular distance spin or not? Uh, you divide this up by the uh, total number of points you're counting uh, to get a mean, and there's an area correction. So this is a simple example. If this is the point I'm starting with, I have different di uh, diameter bins. I'm going to count up all the individuals that I find in here, um, you know, calculate the mean over the, having done this for every different point, and then, uh, you know, normalize each of these by the, the areas that I'm sampling. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the first few annulus, kind of first few donuts that's simple, and then here in this one, it starts to get more complicated because I'm intersecting, uh, the boundary and I need to account for that loss of area. And if I move to the next bin, it would be kind of a really funky uh, bit. So here's a example of calculating Ripley's K for the three uh, randomly generated maps we looked at earlier. So uh, first for the random map, we see that uh, the, uh, the actual uh, Ripley's K statistic falls within those bootstrap confidence intervals quite naturally. And there's no indication that this random pattern is anything different than random. Um, you know, there's a slight uh, positiveness to this, but it's totally within the range of what you would expect by random chance. Uh, if we look at the over dispersed, uh, what we see is that this statistic is negative between the distance of uh, zero and one. And that's indicating that uh, between zero and one, I'm encountering less individuals than I would expect by chance, which is, a, a, again, an indication of over dispersion. So we're over dispersed on the scale of, of between zero and one. And then after that, it's actually not that distinguishable from random, you know, maybe a few little hints of, of peaks coming up. Uh, we do see kind of this uh, almost periodicity to uh, the statistic because, you know, you're going to be encountering uh, points at a, a regular frequency. You also see that the periodicity isn't uh, always strictly um, on integer numbers because you're also encountering uh, individuals fairly regularly on the diagonal as well. Okay, and then for the clustered graph, uh, 
uh, simulated map here, we see, uh, in this case, we're detecting significantly more individuals by chance at distances uh, between zero and two. And then after two, uh, the pattern is fairly random. So that would suggest in this case uh, that we have clusters of, you know, that have a cluster uh, diameter of about two, which is what kind of what we see visually. You can quantify that that's the size of the clusters. Uh, but then we're seeing that beyond that, things are random. So the, the, the locations of the clusters themselves uh, is random. Uh, you know, if these clusters were uh, not random, you know, if these clusters were over dispersed, we might see, you know, a negative bump at the scale of their over dispersal, uh, or maybe the clusters are themselves clustered at some higher scale. Uh, it could also be that you know, this map is fairly small and you don't actually have much power to detect clustering, uh, you know, the, the spatial pattern of the clusters themselves. Ripley's K is fairly straightforward to calculate in R using uh, the, the spatial library. Um, so I'm gonna work through uh, this code. So you load up the spatial library and the first thing you need to do is define uh, a point pattern region. In this case, we're just defining it as a bounding box with a minimum and maximum in the X direction and a minimum and maximum in the Y direction. So we're just defining a rectangle or a point pattern region. And that is you know, important for these functions to know to be able to do those area calculations. Uh, to calculate Ripley's K, we just use the, the K function. We pass in the our observed data, which is gonna be a, uh, a matrix with uh, two columns for uh, the coordinates. Um, so those are coordinate pairs. And then we give the maximum distance that we want to calculate uh, Ripley's K out to. And that returns uh, an object that's a calculation of Ripley's K statistic. Uh, two key things in that statistic are you know, the X bin locations and the Y statistic. Um, the actual tr traditional Ripley's K is defined in a way where uh, the null expectation is along the one-to-one -one line. Uh, so it's it's very common to get to generate the figures like we saw where the null, ex uh, uh, the null expectation is around the, the zero line uh, to just uh, subtract off the X from the Y. So that moves the reference point uh, to the uh, the x-axis rather than the one-to-one -one line, which you know, most people find easier to interpret. So I'm just plotting uh, the, the x and the y of the Ripley's k statistic itself as a line uh, labeling the x and the y. So here it's saying I'm plotting ld rather than kd. Uh, and then I'm gonna need to compute those uh, bootstrapped interval estimates. And that's handled primarily by, by two functions. Uh, first, this PSIM function that actually simulates random maps, uh, and then this uh, K envelope function that does the uh, interval estimation, you know, calculates the, the comps intervals uh, from these bootstrapped uh, maps. And we count the number of points that we, we need to simulate and the number of replicates uh, and uh, yeah, the K envelope will call that point simulation function uh, multiple times and give us those envelopes. And then I'm, you know, like the K uh, function itself, it's going to return an, an X. And in, instead of a, just a Y, it's going to return an upper and lower, which is very analogous to like what we get with the, any sort of uh, comps interval function calculation. Uh, likewise, we need to reference those to the one-to-one -one line. And that just will, you know, this code here is what will draw uh, those three Ripley's K uh, uh, plots we saw, saw on the previous slide. So that that's kind of sums up the basics of uh, point pattern analysis. It's it's probably one of the simpler forms of spatial analysis. Uh, it can be extended a little bit, so you can extend. Uh, the, the basic calculation we saw here to uh, irregularly shaped areas. 
So you might need to do that within uh, some GIS software. Uh, you can also extend it by thinking about, um, you, know, you can't use the attributes of points uh, in the calculation of the statistic itself, but you can use attributes of points uh, to decide whether certain points are included. Uh, so, you know, a simple example is if I map the trees in the forest, uh, something that my lab has actually done many times, um, I might uh, aggregate the trees into different classes based on size. Uh, and there's actually an expectation and, and a, a lot of examples showing that uh, juvenile trees, the little ones in the understory, are actually aggregated, uh, which is a often interpreted as uh, the result of dispersal limitation. They're aggregated around the adults. Uh, that at intermediate stages, uh, medium-sized trees tend to be fairly randomly uh, dispersed, and that's because processes like density-dependent mortality take this aggregated pattern that we see in the juveniles and preferentially thin them out. Uh, and then and for adults in the uh, canopy, we often find them to be over-dispersed because their crowns compete with each other, and so they are, are more regular than you would expect by chance because they're because of co competitive processes um, and you could do that with other sorts of point pattern data you know you could say you know, here's the overall data but you know maybe maybe these blue points are aggregated and these you know red points are over dispersed or whatever your uh, attributes are that are of interest 